Did you rock a mustache last year? I d- yeah, I usually always bust oh, off the mule. Uh, I know you do. I know in your video you're like, hasn't failed me yet, but it's bound to at some point. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back. There you go. Episode 32? Three? Yep. Uh, three. Two. Should be two. Is it? You said one this morning. Did I? Unless that was wrong. No, it's 33. Well, you were wrong this morning. Then. Did I say 31 <laughs> this morning? Yeah. Damn it. Well, they're listening to it a week later, so it's 33. Okay, cool. 37. And uh, again, we talked about this in the last podcast. We're kind of stacking these up a little bit. We're still in August, but we're going to have these kind of stacked a little bit just with travel and everything. August cool. 3rd today. Yep. And so if you're listening to this, it's probably... Less than one month from mule deer mm-hmm. time. It's probably August 17th, if you're listening to this. Ish. Uh, I should be on a beach right now. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That sounds nice. Maybe drinking a shandy or two. Mm. Mm-hmm. My boys. My boys. They left me a shandy. <laughs> Um, but what's cool about this one is if it is the 17th, we are less than two weeks away from departure to the Dakotas for our Dakota double attempt. Um, and that's what makes this guest so cool is we've got someone who was kind of, uh, I don't know if I would say inspiration or just really great source of education of what to maybe expect in the badlands when we got there certainly a good source of excitement because i think we were yeah. we were pumped up and he there's, there's some videos that jason is his name put, put us like some of the videos he's put out were the closest to what our hunt ended up being like and so that it was mm-hmm. pretty cool yeah and it was i mean it, you know in retrospect building up to it it's like man like you know are we gonna have that success or what is is it gonna look like that where we are and then once you get out there you're like Okay, like we're in it. Like yeah. this is what he was hunting as well. Yeah. Um. And so, what's cool about Jason? He's from Wisconsin. Yeah. Sounds yep. right. So he, you know, he makes this trip out to the Dakotas, and he puts together some really cool films. Um, on his hunt, and um, you know, the dude's always in big bucks is the easiest way to say it. Yeah, I think he's killed one every year he's been out there. We'll ask him about that. Yeah, he didn't get drawn last year. Is why we haven't seen a film mm. yet this year. He went on an elk hunt and. Did some other stuff. He's drawing this year? Yeah, he'll be out there this year. He hunts a little north of us, I think. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to say his last name. I'm going to have to ask him that. Belo- yeah. Belobo. <laughs> is that what it is? Belo- B-E-A-U. Like like the word. Belo. The, like the name Bo mm-hmm. is spelled B-E-A-U. Yep, Bo. L-I-E-U. Belo. Belo. Let's ask him. Like the bear. Let's bring it. <laughs> yeah, from Jungle Book? <laughs> yeah, right. I get it. Let's bring in Jason. Let's ask him his last name. Cool. I'm hey, now we're, we got how are we doing? Welcome, welcome. Jason, how do you say your last name? It's uh, Baloo. It was. How about see? that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Baloo. That's pretty close. Baloo. Yeah. You hear that? Yeah. I mean, close enough. I've heard it worse. Put it that way. Yeah, there you go. Baloo. Cool. That's a nice last name. Love that. Awesome, man. Well, Jason, we appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, one of the things that Jared and I were just kind of talking about is when we got drawn for North Dakota in 2020, you know, the immediate thing, first of all, it was kind of shocked because we were told, like, we weren't going to draw. Um, yeah. That, dude, that's one of the first dates we put in for. Like, yeah. Because we, like, we're whitetail guys around here. Like, we've been playing for Iowa. But somebody got us excited to go out and check out some mule deer hunting. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah. He's like, I don't know how long it takes to hunt, uh, to draw or whatever. He's like, but why don't you just go ahead and start putting in for it? So we did think it would take four to six years. And sure enough, it, it didn't. It didn't. Yeah. Now back to back years at this point, um, yeah, like fairly like not many tags given out for that either, and it's kind of fluctuated right about that fifty percent. I mean, since they kind of switched it over to uh, for it too, so there was a couple of years it was not quite fifty percent to get it, but hmm. really to hunt mule deer and like it, I guess really a pretty quality state. Um, you know, fifty percent to get to go hunting is really in today's world, um, pretty awesome. Yeah. Pretty good odds. It was weird. Cause the first time we put in, it was, we did it individually and cause we didn't know you could put in a group. So Jeremy and I both put in individually and just lucked out that we both got drawn. And then this year we put in as a group. And mm-hmm. so we kind of guaranteed that we either both were going or, or not. And we kind of expected us not to get drawn this year. I didn't. I thought, I thought we were going. I don't know how, cause it seemed like luck last year. 50%, I'm like, man. 50-50. 50-50. Might as well be a weather tails every time. 
<laughs> Unless you're in the Dakotas, of which it never rains. Yeah. Which we should talk about. So, so Jason, I guess a couple of background pieces on you. Uh, so you're from Wisconsin? Yeah. Yeah. West Central Wisconsin. Just grew up on whitetails and kind of like you guys, you know, like last year going out, just my end of the mule deer stuff just started a few years ago. So. And, and you, your job is you saw Sarah boat salesman up there, right? Yep. 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 And so that works yep. out pretty good for the season dates to where you're like. Yeah, for, the, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, busy, busy in the spring, busy most of the summer and then rolling in the fall, you know, kind of more prep and going into next year. So really on the hunting side of things, um, it works out fairly well. So very cool. Love that. How many mule deer have you killed to date? Uh, I guess I'd have to one, two, five or six, I suppose. Mm, five. Yeah. I think we've seen films of what, three of them? Um, I think just two, I believe. I can just put two up, at least for, for mule deer, at least. Okay. Very cool. And so Jared said last year you didn't draw, but you did this year. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't draw last year, you know, hunted, hunted South Dakota. Um, and, uh, the year before that, obviously in 1900 North Dakota, but usually I always try to have something lined up for September. Sure. It's kind of the goal. Um, you know, South Dakota now is a non-resident. You can't hunt public land until October now. Mm-hmm. So it just hangs on, you know, really getting a North Dakota tag. Um, you know, Wyoming was fairly early as well, but now kind of back to point building there. So. Right. That makes sense. This uh, doing oh, any different here at all? That sounds so much Love better. Love it. Perfect. Well, let me set this there. Flip this computer on so I can have me a little kickstand here. Are you on your Wi-Fi on that uh, laptop or phone? What's that? Are you on your Wi-Fi? Holy shit. Uh, I said Where it is that both. buck from? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. The game has just changed. Oh, word. That's why he was cutting. He's like, man, I really After wanted to what, use my computer. So you guys didn't see that. I guess that's the first North Dakota buck. You filming? Are you recording? Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah. So it would have been three. Now I'm thinking about it. So yeah. That had been the yeah, very first one. I thought one. it was three. That's, uh, that was a Sodak Damn. deer a couple years ago. That's actually the deer like why I quit filming was because of that deer. That was. Why? I, you know, it was one that like I was jacking with the camera and uh i gotta get some prop to sing up a little higher i was jacking with a camera and that thing stood up out of his bed and turned around and looked at me and i picked my head up and realized he was looking at me <laughs> wow mm. um, and then i mean luckily he was with a doe and um i got back in front of him and and then ended up obviously killing him but it was just kind of one of those like anger moments you could say oh yeah dude we've all had it from a <laughs> one film of those side. anger moments yeah, yeah. Uh, dude, i mean the frustration around filming and self-filming is is always been one that's you know i'm super happy when it works out and i've i've accomplished it but the entire way from the time i leave my truck with all my gear to the time that i actually film something i'm just angry right that's I mean, it's, I mean, I shouldn't say always angry, but in the same sense, like it's, uh, there's definitely those moments of like, why the F am I doing this? Yeah. Um, uh, Lots you know, of them. That's perfect. That looks great. John. That looks good. That's great. Look good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. You're good. Cool. Um, what were we were talking about, we got distracted by big bucks. Uh, I think we're, Oh, I know what I was going to say. So I guess, so Jared and I, obviously with this year, um, we put in for North Dakota again, cause we had such a, a fantastic time out there last year. Yeah, just a blast. Yeah. And so then we started looking into like, all right, well it opens whatever third or fourth this year. Well, what about South Dakota? And then it's like, and we, then it was cause we tagged out so fast. Like we, ta we tagged out on the second and third day and we're like, well, dude, like we're driving 24 hours. Let's do more while we're out here. Mm -hmm. So we started looking at South Dakota, figured out it was over the counter, figured Mid out about midway, the public midway through our excitement, found out that bull crap and we're like well okay we gotta yep. figure that out yeah so which is still somewhat up in the air we, we do have a lease in south dakota for a small track of ground relative to what you're going to find out there um so i'm still going to call around i think i'm gonna spend the next couple of weeks here trying to get permission on we need rain you get permission on one five thousand acre track and you're you're good for a week mm -hmm. right yeah 
and well, no, yeah, I mean, just simply having having more ground to go on too. I yeah, he never really knows if he's had his cattle in there for the last six months too. Yeah, well, and that's kind of where we're at with it. Is you know, it's a it's eleven hundred acres is what we have, which sounds like a lot, but out there is not. We've never um, seen it. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've seen, I mean, I've seen the topography out there, and like you might be able to see clear across the thing. Yeah, for, we don't know. For all I know. Yeah, I mean, there's I'm yeah. sure there's antelope out there. Um, which is cool. I pu- I picked up an antelope tag actually, just because. What did that run you like? Sixty five bucks? No, two eighty five. Really? Same as the muley. Wow. Yeah, but we can't hunt antelope in North Dakota right. as a non resident. Right. So it's like, well, might as well. Sure. When in Rome. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's all I had. <laughs> but so Please I guess, continue. <laughs> so when you said you went out and hunted, so was it last year that you hunted South Dakota then? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So South Dakota, I actually, so I drew a Montana tag last year. Oh, wow. Um, so I drew the, the big game combo. So I had an elk tag. So I went on elk hunt in September and then plan on going back, um, in like the late season during rifle. Cause you can hunt, you know, almost the entire month of November out there with a rifle. So, you know, I was doing things with a bow, like, you know, it'd have been nice to just go <laughs> carry a rifle around and try to shoot a big muley and, um, it, it ended up being, I come back from South Dakota and then one of the cylinders went out of my truck, like oh. two days before Montana. So it was actually probably a good thing that it happened like three miles from my house and not yes. six hours west. <laughs> yes. Did you rock a mustache last year? I d- yeah. I usually always bust oh. up. Yeah. I know you do. I know in your video, you're like, hasn't failed me yet, but it's bound to at some point. <laughs> <laughs> It hasn't yet. So we'll run it till it dies, I suppose. That's the way to do it, man. I've run one in Kansas for several years, and it's weak, but it's there, and it's failed me multiple times. I just don't think the deer can see it. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. It's indistinguishable. They can't tell. Uh, so, Jason, when you were out hunting South Dakota, were you hunting muleys or whitetails or both? You know, pretty much always mule deer. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely – well, I shot one in, I think 2018, a white tail, like while I was making a stock on a mule deer and I was actually like running a decoy and a mule deer, or excuse me, a white tail come from three quarters of a mile up to 30 yards. And, you know, I mean, I let one fly. I mean, uh, I'll be opportunistic when need be, but mm-hmm. you know, I definitely go out there to, uh, to shoot a mule deer. Yeah. That, that's unique to, for us. We've never been anywhere, well, I guess, anywhere you can hunt mule deers, first of all, but um, mule deer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, but to be out in like North Dakota, and I think South Dakota will be similar where they are just cohabitating. Um, Is that a word? Yeah. Nice. Right? Co ed. Co- cohabitating. <laughs> Cohabit. Yeah, that sounds good. They're habitating the same area. Together. And, uh, yeah, that was that was really cool. We saw some giant whitetail in, in North Dakota. We did, man. Almost enough to distract us from our goal i wouldn't have i mean don't get me wrong i mean even this year oh yeah we're not a giant white tail tail. yeah i'm i'm gonna i'm going after but i mean the difference between making a stock on a mule deer and making a stock on a white tail is a big big difference i think like jason's deal there like you got to get kind of lucky you're saying he's not skillful just luck white tails are definitely trickier to get up on well i actually really white tails just don't put themselves like in place or you know easier to stalk in on mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah when they start running they don't stop yeah. at least with a mule deer he'll stop after 200 yards and find a shady spot yeah right yeah just go up over a lip and then go find the next crease yeah whereas it will just run until i don't know it hits the sun on the sunset 100 <laughs> percent. that's that's been odd i guess or an experience for us to try to figure out is like we're used to whitetail and how jumpy they are and so like we know how to act around mm-hmm. them and but we don't quite know that with muleys and so it's like we're we're trying to be super careful and yeah, stuff like we don't want to blow them out mm-hmm. like what, what is the wind blowing and stuff and um uh, we've only we to combined we have like th- th- three four days of mule deer hunting experience to to go on but like you could say we're pretty seasoned between that and talking to other guys like it it does seem like they're they're not quite as 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 jumpy they're a little easier like you said jason to to make a stock on like mm-hmm. a, it may not be possible with a white tail. Possibly. Yeah, like the like the white tail freak out factor isn't there in a meal there. Like right. just a like a touch less, you know, like yeah. you said, jumpy um mm-hmm. in meal deer. Yeah. I'd say like they use their 
I would almost say like I've probably gotten caught more by the ones that you don't see, like more than like the one that you're focused on ever. You For know? sure. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Well, Jason, I think we, we're both interested to know kind of just like um, maybe more about like how, how you got into this North Dakota trip. And even, yeah. if, even if you want to fast forward to like, um, you know, if somebody's going to plan a trip like this or, or even for us, because yeah, we had some success on our first trip, but like this will be our second mule deer trip ever. Um, if, if you want to sh- like share some pointers with us, so it's like, hey, this is how I kind of approach the hunt. I, I spend the first couple of days doing this. Like maybe I do some spike camps or, or whatever. We'd certainly love to know that. I think some of our listeners would too. Yeah, I, I'd probably like take it back to like how I first started hunting South Dakota. Like that'd probably be like a good, just because it's kind of, well, the most recent and fresh in my brain. And I kind of specifically went to South Dakota, like, you know, mule deer states you know i had some i you know actually had some idea from hunting nebraska and north dakota um but really i that first time in south dakota i covered like way more i i thought i would do the whole map thing you know obviously you know now i kind of know a little more what to look for but i've myself probably like gone away from staring at the map and getting like a preconceived notion of what things look like Mm -hmm. because up there especially you know drought makes a big difference and i feel like i say this a thousand times but cattle makes a big difference out there too you know and that's like it's not something that you'd know until you physically get there Mm -hmm. um so i probably valued less of my imaging searching when i went to south dakota the first time um And I just did way more driving and like looking at pieces before I got my head wrapped around like, okay, I'm going here. I'm going to walk to the back of this and then I'm going to turn left and take this drainage up and I'll be able to look and see all this stuff. Well, you start doing that, you burn in time. And, and then before you know it, you're another morning is gone. And then you've got to kind of reset for and find something to go into in the evening. So all the time, I guess I spent in South Dakota, it was like just routinely happening. I had all these dots marked out. And also on top of that, you realize that your dots on, on Google, you know, on Onyx are, you know, even though you've got roads that go to them, um, you know, they happen to be a two hour drive instead of the 25 minute that you had in the back of your head right. that it would take um, or the two track that looks like a road is nowhere near a road. Um, you know, or the two track that looks like a road that doesn't get used is, you know, is looks like the, the highway central going in there. Yeah. So I would say from myself, I kind of, after I went back that first time, I kind of had like areas instead of like spots, I would say. Like that'd probably be a good way to put it. Um, were you marking like, I, like vantage points? Is that the, the points that you were dropping? Yeah. You know, now I probably, you know, now I do that probably more, um, you know, as far as marking vantage points, but now I'm probably looking more at, all right. So this square section, like, you know, this one's got some terrain, you know, some topography to it, where you can definitely tell there's some steeper drainages in it. Um, and then whether there's like trees in the bottom of it or no trees, um, mm-hmm. I'm still paying attention to that, but way more like highway time, I would say to, to just simply look and see what's there. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I think I just, I just went to like, I can't overstate like how, uh, how big, like, cattle make a difference i mean it's just there's either life there or there isn't um Mm -hmm. and 30 seconds pulling down the road you can see that you can just see it from the truck even you know to at least have an idea like okay like i can walk here and get to this next section that you know you can physically see better than say where the truck is and you almost always have to go further than what you can see from the vehicle Mm. um sometimes that's a mile sometimes it's a quarter mile sometimes it's two miles or you know it seems like two miles i should say but yeah that's interesting i mean one of the things that you know i guess i'm i'm curious about jason especially on the south dakota side is uh, you know doing the research around the two 
it seems like the mule deer range in South Dakota is much, much smaller than what you have in North Dakota. Like, you know, I know that you're north of where we hunt in North Dakota. And so like, you know, from where you're at to where we're at, it's still a great distance and it's, you know, all mule deer country. Whereas it seems like in South Dakota, like there's a, there's a certain section of the state in the Northwest really. And then a lot of the rest of the state, you may find spotty ones, but it's mostly whitetail country. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's fairly accurate. Maybe a little more spotty and probably getting to be a little more whitetail ground, uh, obviously, especially the further East you go in South Dakota. And there's a lot of reservation land in South Dakota too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of that West river portion that you just simply can't, I shouldn't say you can't hunt, but you know, uh, as far as going through reservation tags and things like that, much more difficult to be able to hunt things in, I mean, actually a vast majority of, I mean, you cut that West river into, you know, four sections. And I mean, for sure the top right section, you can't hunt at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so so do you, think, th- you think Jason on, on years like we're having here with like some pretty extreme drought out there. I, I know I asked you about this on the phone the other day. I was like, are you concerned about it? And you're like, well, I hunt river bottom country. So no, like they're all, all the mule deer are going to be there. Um, yeah. is that something that you're like kind of looking for? And like, honestly, as we're looking to gain some more access in, in South Dakota, I, I may look exclusively at pieces that have like, you know, big bodies of water or the the river running through it. Brad Pitt. Yeah. I guess I can't say I've correlated that with South Dakota yet. Um, and really with North Dakota, I mean, you know, the Missouri runs right through the heart of the badlands yep. through most of it. And just kind of my experience there, like we were talking on the phone, you know, in 17, you know, I was hunting deer that were, I mean, they were closing in on almost two miles from the river and it wasn't until multiple days. And then seeing one crossing the road in front of me that I then seen later in the morning on public, like, oh, well, now this makes sense what they're doing. Um, they just, they start, if you want to say set up and travel further than what the whitetails do. Um, and I, that's at least what I correlated it to. Cause that was a pretty dry year there too. Mm-hmm. I, like that piece of the puzzle together in South Dakota say, but again, I haven't hunted in South Dakota early too. You know, I've only been in South Dakota from, you know, mid October, you know, to, you know, throughout November, I guess. So that's okay. probably, you know, a part of it there too. I think it's probably a similar observation, but ag was a part of that too. So those alfalfa bottoms, like what we noticed was a lot of the mule deer were filtering off the badlands down into these ag bottoms, but that ag butted right up to the river. So Mm -hmm. yeah, one and the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's kind of a similar deal in South Dakota. I I assume anywhere there's water will be the best, you know, ag. Well, we did anywhere there's ag and water is where we're going to find. We did see a lot of mule deer in, in cut wheat fields as well that seemed to roll off some of the hills and into cut wheat fields. And those weren't necessarily in the bottoms. They were near it, but they weren't, yeah, they weren't necessarily in the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just kind of like the, if you want to say terrain change from like as far South as you guys are versus, you know, that Northern part, I think you guys just, then there's just more ag down Mm. that too. Um, yep. mm-hmm. kind of along the river there. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we spent half we're, of we're, our, we're right on the, the verge, like right, on, right the, on the Missouri there. R- yeah. And I mean, it, we, we spent a lot of our time and this is where, you know, the whitetail guy in us probably got the better of us is it's like, Oh cool. Like look where there's this little bit of badlands, but there's so much food over here. And you're like, cool. There's a deer whitetail. There's a deer whitetail. There's a deer whitetail. There's a pronghorn. And you're like, oh, there's a muley doe, but you're like, man, is this like, are we in the right country? We we had it all mixed up, like, cause yeah, I, we were just trying to watch videos and like figure out what is it like out there. I don't know, like I've been to the Badlands once, mm-hmm. but so there there's I think a lot more high country mule deer hunts on YouTube than there are Badlands mule deer hunts. And so in my head, I'm like, all right, vantage point, tripod, like glassing. We're gonna set up on a basin or whatever and glass the whole day, and we're gonna hunt those deer for the week. And so I, like you said, I was looking at maps mm-hmm. on the eastern side, the ag side of this river, where it seems like okay, here's some good vantage points. Like the, we'll, we'll check out a few of these vantage points. We'll probably stay there for a week. And once we got there, n- not only were the mule deer not on that ag side where where we thought they would be, but there's no, you know, there's no. It's not it's not a high country mule deer hunt. It, it's a lot of like maybe you're going to see some of them coming back off the the fields in the morning, the alfalfa back up and in, and if you can track them you know, pretty good ways, 
you know, in a general vicinity where they're at. Um, but it also seems like um, just still hunting is is honestly as about as effective of a strategy out there as you're going to get. It's just slowly walking them ditches out and leaning out over these, you know, these cut banks. And what did the local tell us? One in every hunter is going to have a mule deer mm-hmm. laying in there. And that's how you kill deers. Yeah, straight down. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that, and it makes sense too. Um, like I said, we're not, you know, watching slopes and like those deer aren't in that basin all summer, whereas, you know, they're just simply traveling more, I think, in that area, whether it's food related or water related, I guess, not sure. But um, the, they definitely seem to cover more, more ground, I would say, um, on a day to day basis. And I would say that probably lines up with how I am usually hunting things. You know, like I said, I'd, I don't like to say I'm the truck guy. I mean, I mean, who, who wants to I was to about say to say the same thing, dude. I'm not afraid to say that we drove way more than we walked. We need to find yeah. a, We need to find a North Dakota license plate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I think that's just kind of like a reality of at least hunting. That stuff is, is the open ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I'd probably burn more on the tires and then, you know, at least I, I've got that idea of like, this is if you want to call it the most recent info or however like that is what is there right now and that's really about you know at least in the summer or if if you want to say late summer months it's about the only thing that does matter is like where are they right now just because i don't have enough time to be out there all summer and sure you know and spend time scouting um to know if there are i mean Maybe those, maybe they do um, have normal travel routes and things like that. And like you were saying, you know, if they're going to egg fields in the dark, you know, uh, uh, maybe there's a, a way to actually pinpoint that. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like there aren't quite as, if you want to say predictable as a whitetail is in that sense, at least. Yeah. I think that's accurate. I think part of that's that travel um, that they're willing to do on a daily basis and, the other thing, at least where we were in the in the North Dakota and South Dakota is going to be the same way, is that, you know, even though there was a ton of public, it was interlaced with private and that private tended to be the prime stuff, right? And so, yeah. you know, you were literally looking at uh, a hillside of bucks that was bedded on private <laughs> land and thinking like, are they going to cross this fence? And in all reality, you knew, no, they're not. They, and they know that too. It, it was bizarre to watch too. Cause like, I mean, back home, like wouldn't it be amazing to like watch whitetails go from a food source to their bed and be like, Oh, I see what they're doing here. There's none of that. Like they mm-hmm. disappear into the cornfield and they're gone forever. Yeah. You know, but out there it's like, you can see everything. It's like, Oh, okay. I, they're I here. They are. They're all yeah. eating here. Okay. Let me watch this group for a while. Oh, okay. These guys are working back up into the, Oh, okay. They're going to bed over there. It's so weird to see it's eye opening actually to see. Um, both from the, the food side of it. And also that one night we went and set up on, on the bed side of it to mm-hmm. see where they're coming from and where they're going to. And we watched them. We, we put it together pretty quick. They were in an open hillside. I just, got swarmed by bugs. Or yeah. Whatever, just but. chilling, just sitting there in an open hillside. They looked at us directly at us and we're like, yeah, I'm not coming down there anyway. So I'm not going to run. Like, like I'm going this way. See that public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they know where the. <laughs> I know, man. And that's what's so weird about it. And, um, you know, I think what's what really kind of caught at least me off guard is, again, like we found some really good bucks on public and, and we worked for them. But the number of bucks that would flock into these private fields. I mean, there was one field that literally we saw 17, like substantially nice mule deer and a couple just absolute freaks in one field, 25 yards off the road. And we know where they came it's from. Kind of, it's kind of frustrating. I you descri- just can't kill them. I described it like finding that that fishing hole that has all these giant palomino trout in it, and just it doesn't matter what you throw down in front of them. Like it's just you can't catch them. Yeah, well, we can't even cast in it. Right. <laughs> right. It's yeah. not illegal to shoot from public. <laughs> is what I heard. Oh, I'm. Th- I'll. I'll. Sh- I'll throw a 105 this year. Yeah, as long as you shoot from <laughs> public, you're in good shape. Yeah, <laughs> but. But I think, and I don't know if you've experienced, and no knock to him, I get it, he's making a business, but um, part of that major private there was an outfitter. Um, Sure. And, uh, you know, I highly doubt he'd ever listen to our podcast, but if he did, hey, we're talking to you. Like, he was a dick. Yeah, he was being Like, there was a guy who had had parked where we parked and walked, you know, it wasn't much as a mile or so back into where I killed my buck. And that's, you're right up against- Yeah, on public. You're right up against his fence, but you're waiting for these deer to move into this public bottom- 
and I killed mine back there on public. And the guy was working up, and that son of a bitch drove the fence line in his truck right next to him. The yeah, whole way was parallel on him on the on his side of the fence. So literally in nineteen, I had almost identical situation happen. That was actually the night before season opened with with a landowner too, um, where I parked on the public side of the fence, and I could I just had seen a truck coming down the road. And of course, you know, you see a Wisconsin plate vehicle, you know, if you live out there, I'm sure everybody stops, but you know, in the same sense, see that the truck had stopped, you know, so I'm watching with vinyls, like, you know, dude, you're going to get out and <laughs> slash my tires or, you know, just, I, I dare you. Know, yeah. I'm watching, but you know, not that I'm doing, it can do anything from 600 yards away, but it, truck left and about five minutes later i could hear a razor coming you know or side by side coming mm. down the road and all of a sudden turned right there at the fence and come right on down the fence line wow and, and i i ran down to because i was probably 200 yards from the fence itself and so i ran down there to try and like talk to him to like because i knew that was just where i was going yep. i just just where I wanted to be. Um, and I wanted to like confront that situation and either figure out like if I'm either going to make this end right now, or I'm going to know this isn't going to end. Yeah. And I tried catching up to him and, and he had already went past. So I continued out to the truck and, and, uh, I buzzed down the road and, and I went and sat at the end of his driveway for him. And, uh, and just, he come down the hill about a half hour later and they call that premeditated. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole time I'm just, you know, kind of like stewing in my head, like, you know, how this conversation yep. go, you know, everything else. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I probably come off a little brash right away, but you know, I, right off the bat just said, you know, I'm guessing you're looking for me. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, if you'd like to know, I'm, I'm off of this finger here and I've got zero interest in, hunting your side of the fence and I know where your fence is. And, um, you know, he said he was just out checking fences, but, right. uh, a little hunters. bit into it, you know, things eased up and we just had a good conversation, but like, I guess I am the type of person of, uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm doing everything by the book. If yeah. you want to say, uh, I'm a, usually a pretty non confrontational person, mm -hmm. but, uh, same sense, like, I guess I've got my vacation days too, and I don't want them to get screwed up. It, well, is, that's it is tough, man. Yeah. Well, I think, dude, a lot of those guys, whether they don't recognize or they just don't appreciate or they just don't care, that, like, man, we think about this th for an entire year. Like, yeah. from the time that we left last year, I was like, we have to do this. Yeah, again. we're coming back. This, is, this was awesome. And, like, we're driving like 24, 20, 25, 26 hours to spend you know, seven day, and we're by the days there. And, to, and it's like, that's all we got. Yeah, we're know? not stepping foot on your property. I'll tell you what gets me more than that. And, and Dakota's is a good one. Although we just experienced it in Illinois is like driving the roads, public roads. Right. And just glass and deer and guys stopping. And like, we had a guy in Illinois who just stopped and like nagged us for 20 minutes. I was a cop. <laughs> no, 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 not the cop. The guy in the big truck with him and his kid who stopped when oh, we were glass yeah. and yeah. And he's like, well, yeah, you know, like I hunt right up here. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, we're just like glassing these bucks, seeing what's out there. And basically finally said, yeah, like those are our deer. And I'm like, no, they're not. I was like, like oh, that's public. Ya. That's public. You hunt up here. I don't even know who owns this field, but I'm on a public road. Nobody's coming. Like, am I? But they think that they have some right to push you out of there because we're a non-resident, I think, mostly. Uh, you could be a resident, too. I. I don't know if like people are so ate up about the out of staters as much as they are just anybody on their yeah you know, their deer. I'd say just, like sometimes just like hunters in general. You yeah. know that gentleman in particular just had the the worst feel on planet Earth for gun hunters. Um, you know, but I, I think that's just one bad hunter is like wrapped into that's every it. single that moment on. Yeah. yeah, that that is unfortunate and almost. A lot of land have has. had bad interactions. With I hunters. do think that's where and there's we, some bad hunters out there. We get some leeway as bow hunters. Like the moment you start talking about bow hunting, like obviously the guys that we saw are not going to necessarily care about that. But a lot of landowners, if you're like, but that's how we got into Kansas. Like if we came into Kansas and tried to get some property and we said, hey, yeah, we're gun hunting, no way. Yeah. But when we were like, yeah, we're just bow hunting, we'll be here for a week, a year, they're like, yeah, that sounds great. 
I, I think even bow hunters or even uh, landowners understand that, like, there's nothing wrong with rifle hunting. Don't get me wrong, but I think they understand that there is uh, like more, uh, like skill, skill in, and care. involved. Yeah, in bow hunting, and they're mm-hmm. like, man, you know this. I think at least they can appreciate the the effort that's put into to bow hunting as opposed to you know to rifle hunting and and sometimes it's enough to where they're like oh okay yeah I don't have a problem with you or yeah you can hunt my mm-hmm. property or whatever not always but yeah that outfitter wouldn't let us do that no and he's running a business <laughs> of bow hunters you know so how much you want <laughs> yeah and, and everybody but yeah it is um so I guess kind of going back on the South Dakota thing I I think it's interesting because that's one that you know. Again, just like North Dakota last year, we're kind of flying in blind, Jason, and you know we're we're very tight on that top northwest corner, which seems to be pretty heavy in terms of mule deer. Not that we're turning a blind eye if we see a big white tail, and and obviously I carry a pronghorn tag, but like I I think that for us it's it's again kind of the weird thing is is in North Dakota at least we could drive and we had access to a lot of land. Now we don't, right? Yeah. We're not we're, yet. Well, not yet, but still, we're captured in an area of, like, this is all we've got. Um, and so I assume it's going to be finding those deer on those food, food sources, probably. It, I, I'm kind of looking at it like, worst case scenario, we'll go check out the lease, see what it's like, and try to make some landowner contacts. I'll reach out to some people beforehand and see if we can just stop in and, and chat with them. Best case scenario, we get there, the, the lease is awesome, that'd be great. Um, and we've gotten some permission on some river bottom Mm-hmm. Uh, neighbors yeah neighbors essentially and we spend some time there mm-hmm. and if it's worst case we'll probably only spend a two day and a half there two yeah. days there if it's good and we're getting into deer it's like you know we're not going to leave big deer to go to big deer necessarily we'll we'll stick we'll it out split for a it out mm-hmm. it's a plan yeah kind of up in the air well and at least like having like a home base too are you guys able to like stay on that property yeah the like, lease yeah yep we'll be able, we're gonna park our uh our camper there and and plug in electricity it's not as nice as our north dakota spot but it'll it'll do we'll see yeah we'll make it nice we'll make a home yeah it's just an old abandoned cattle farm that's what it is yeah i'm excited just for the prep portion i, I love just planning like the meals we're gonna cook and mm-hmm. like just everything we're going to need in camp and stuff is so much fun for me. So, so Jason, when you go out to North Dakota, I, I forget what it is. Is it the third or fourth this year when the season opens? I don't know. You know that Friday. Friday. Which, um, funny, funny story on that. Uh, obviously, we had no idea last year, right? Rolling out, so we got there the night before, scouted. The next day, we're scouting, and like at like eight a.m. on opening day, like we set eyes on like two big muleys, like right off the road. And we hadn't gotten there yet. We were still on the we, other side of the road. Yeah, I guess we were on the other side. But uh, somebody caught up with us. And we just The neighbors that we were camping by. Yep. Just wanted to chat. Yeah, and they're like, so, like, what's your plan today? And we're like, oh, you know, we're going to just drive around. They're like, well, just so you know, like, season doesn't open till noon. And I'm like, oh, yeah, ja-, you know, joking mm. with the, the, the non-resident guys. <laughs> like, cool. And they're like, no, seriously, like, you can't hunt till noon. We're like, what? Because uh, if not, like, we probably would have pulled a stock on those bucks <laughs> at, like, 8 30 in the morning <laughs> yeah, it would have been like laying in the river until noon <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had no idea you yeah. know so we sat there we got back to the spot. shame on us too man we should have read the red yeah but. yeah i just i've never experienced anything like that yeah it's like oh today's opening day start at noon what yeah it's crazy it's a little it's definitely a little different yeah. it makes like that morning like that much tougher in terms of like how far do you press in? Like how far do you press in on one when you do spot one? Yeah. Like that's kind of always been something that I've done is I probably push the envelope more than maybe I should sometimes, but um like how close do you need to get to him? Yep. Or just <laughs> go find him exactly what tree he's under or do you just kind of know roughly what draw he went up in? And that was kind of and, our uh, gig. I always tend to yeah. Yeah, we we yeah. we knew where he was. He kind of had positioned as the well, sun came up. It was so weird. Like this was our first morning out there and we didn't have a whole lot of luck on the one side of the road that we had these pins dropped or whatever. So we're like, well, let's go check out the other side of the river. Sure enough, we're like a couple hundred yards down this road and there's a freaking big shooter muley a hundred yards off the road bedded right on a, a knob. We're like, is is this for real? Like there's two of them like right there. And we freaked out, and it was early yet. Mm-hmm. It was eight thirty, but we knew at that point that we couldn't hunt them till noon. Mm-hmm. So we just drove the rest of the road out, saw some more bucks, 
And then uh, did we go all the way back to the camper? We did because yeah, we, we, we ended up coming back at 11 and sat back, for an hour regrouped. waiting and waiting and waiting because we were going to make our moves from the road. And basically. then it was like, and 12 o'clock. We went, <laughs> went and stalked this deer. Like we didn't have eyes on him at that point, but I was like, he's got to be in this draw. And that was the first time a Jeremy mule deer kicked my ass. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 if he was where I thought he was, I made the perfect stock. But of course, that's not how it works. And I'm looking in the straw, and I'm like, man, I can't believe this stupid thing. And I like look, and there's a single sage bush like at the end of the draw, and both of them are like huddled under it. And I'm like, son of a bitch. And then I see him. Yeah, about, up, ain't going. <laughs> I actually stocked those bucks the following night, or the yeah, same night, maybe. Same night. Yeah, we saw him coming back down in from the truck. Jumped out, ran up a, a valley. It's so weird how it's just so different. I don't know. Like, we're still figuring it out. But, like, that, those bucks that Jeremy kicked out of there, we knew they were shooters. Like, we would have stalked them 100 times if we had the opportunity. We were driving that road that evening, and we're, we're glassing. And sure enough, up this draw, here they come. I'm like, there's that buck. He's coming back down this way towards the – he's going to cross the road and go into this field. So I just jumped out, grabbed my bow, and I ran up. I could see which direction they're going. I'm like, I just ran up this coolie over here and then just waited. Mm -hmm. And then I started freaking out if I was in the right spot or, and I moved like three or four times. And what happened is they had just hung up down in that bottom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I did get real close. I got within, real I close. was in bow range, but yeah. I think they just heard me or boogered or something. That was, we both blew them out that day. <laughs> but it was fun. It is. I mean, it, when you're looking at that style, Jason, so like the the guys who are next to us, everybody kind of seems like they have their own strategy, right? We don't know what the hell we're doing. We're just out there trying to get on a deer and screw up fast so that we can fix we're, it. We're learning that. We're talking to the locals. We're yeah. figuring out how they're doing it. But like a couple of those guys, they would seem to like just pick like the, the deepest ditch from the road or the deepest coolie from the road. And they're like, yep, there'll be deer in that. And you know, whether they see them or not, they just hike out there. Like they just hike out there and they just walk back and forth on the rim of that ditch essentially all day, you know, likely bumping deer back and forth until they try to get within bow range. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would say I've, I would, I would say I'm surprised like, like kind of like you were just saying, like, you know, seeing bucks like right from the road. And I think it's just an early season thing out there too. Mm -hmm. You know, they have bothered, you know, and boogered as much. Um, I mean, that's kind of been my experience as well. I mean, I've certainly got like my areas, if you want to say that I'm always, you know, targeting or staying in. Um, but for the most part, like those deer, are, I guess the ones that I've been after are certainly pretty easily accessible. Um, at least like seeing them, maybe mm -hmm. not always yeah. able to make like the correct stock cause of wind or, you know, however the private lays, yeah. um, but for the most part, I mean, able to see them most of the time, usually right from the darn road. Um, yeah, yeah. Or at least I should say the hunt always seems to end up much closer to the road than what I, and I always anticipated from here. I and mean, I'm doing the same thing, like trying to look for a little more water this year out in some of that stuff. And, you know, here I'm like, I like regather myself after 25 minutes of looking at like, why am I looking out there that's literally almost two miles like from the truck like i gotta reel this back in here and yeah. uh like just it just doesn't seem like that's always the case but um boy i mean out there i mean i think you could i think you could just do that i think you could probably burn through i don't know if you want to say burn through enough deer but i sure. think you probably could burn through deer and just keep keep walking stuff um until you get if you want to say lucky that you've got one in the right place that you catch before, you know, that you yeah. see it before he does you. Well, the, the buck that I ended up, so Jeremy tagged out on the, the second day and we were just is still hunting the right word for that. We were just creeping mm -hmm. through ditches and peeking over ledges and, and you killed, you know, killed one that way. Mm -hmm. Um, the next day, the next morning we went out, drove the truck up to, you know, this decent vantage point over the alfalfa field and, Sure enough, there's all these bucks out in the field, a bunch of different groups of them and stuff. And I'm like, there's a bunch of shooters in that group. I'd shoot any one of them. And uh, we watched them for a half an hour, 45 minutes, work back across the river. And there's a big chunk of public um, t to the east of the a giant chunk of public, you know, with a bunch of terrain. And we watched them work up in there and we're like, that's where we're going. Like, let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. And so we looked it up on a map and there's no way to access it from 
our side of the river. We had to go all the way out and around and take a two track in and it ended up being about seven miles mm-hmm. <laughs> from, from where we parked the truck to where I ended up killing that deer all the way down at the river. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but round trip, three, three miles each way. Huh? Three miles each way down into the river from the truck to the river. Didn't we put a miles. total of 10 miles on that day? Uh, we I, thought, had- I thought it was seven throughout the day on the way in and then three straight out. No, I don't think it was that much. I think it was three maybe down me because I stopped. We well, yeah. What I, happened is we stumbled <laughs> on a buck halfway through. We're walking down to work. All right, we're probably halfway there, and I just by chance, yeah, I don't know back. how I saw that deer, but there was a nice buck, you know, back behind us where we'd kind of come from. And I was like, dude, freaking, let's. So I ran out and around and ended up bumping that deer twice, but he was nice, like yeah, mid one hundred and fifty, probably something type yeah. deal, full velvet that um we hadn't seen. I don't know how he where he came from, but um. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably did put on more. I think the one thing that. Oh, I definitely put on a lot more. First of all, it felt like we were in mule deer country. We weren't down in there. But the other thing that I thought was interesting is like, we found a bunch of sheds. Like all of a sudden we're just finding sheds all through there. I'm like, okay, I think we're in the right spot. I couldn't believe it. It was right at the end of a two track. I was like, has nobody been down in here? There's sheds everywhere. (laughs) I no joke. We picked up the day I killed my mule deer. We picked up four or five sheds. Huh. I, I've kind of got, uh, we were talking about putting cameras out in that, uh, before a podcast here. And I like that, I've got like one spot house and I was excited to put, it's like a little, there's like a little old cropping little rock piece that I'm going to stick the camera right in. And it's just like on a, a funnel trail and like, same deal. Um, like I found three and like that very short little yep. drainage kind of turned into like a shed hunting evening that time when I, finally seen the first one i was like oh i wonder if there's more and then see a second <laughs> one and wow i wonder if there's more <laughs> that's what we were doing we were just pulling sheds it was and cool. like oh there's a we did we held on to a lot of them we tucked them in our bag mm-hmm. dude if we were going to put a camera out there i think that that spot where they're crossing the river is like it, it's hard to beat mm-hmm. and it's so far down there pub- it's as far down in that piece yeah, of public not as many you people can go. are going in there I mean, I think we got a dynamite spot. We could just kill a buck year after year mm. if you hunt that kind of that area. The hard part for us, Jason, is thinking like, because we can always sit in that spot and watch them work out of the river bottom up into those hills. In a in a best case scenario, if you wanted to kill them in the morning, like it, you'd be in those hills. But it's it's a hike back down in there, and it's pretty gnarly it terrain. Dark. Yeah, I I still think though from uh it, again, it would probably be nice to be able to watch those deer come across and see where they bed, but. I think our strategy, even if we were there a little earlier in the morning, you could get in there while they're already in that area and be it because those deer are moving constantly as the shade is changing and things like that. I, that was the biggest thing I learned. Like I figured, oh man, if they go in bed, like where are they going to be? And then next, you know, like, oh, there's a buck stands up, walks over, sh- sits down here. Like they're moving as that shade changes, which is why the, the buck that you bumped the first time he laid under a ledge and I'm like, man, he's right here. You're going to make this stock. It's going to be perfect. And all of a sudden, it, by the time you got over there, that sun had ate up that shade under the ledge and he slipped out the back and didn't even yeah. know. It. He wasn't there for what, 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'd say like, that's well, the same thing. How I killed that one in 19, you know, that deer, he repositioned on that tree and then it just so happened to be in the first 45 seconds of me getting to where all right, like here's my spot until he stands up. He just happened to stand up and he was going to reposition again. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one of those things I always try to kind of, as I was saying, like kind of flirt that line of being like too fast, maybe mm-hmm. sometimes, but I want to know like where they are. Like mm-hmm. if I lose them in a dip, Stressful. like I'm, I'm gone. Like that's, kind of was saying like that's probably like the frustrating thing with trying to run that camera is it's like another thing to like grab fold up like put together and it's just 20 seconds before and then it's another 20 seconds after that my eyes aren't focused on what's out in front of me um but i would say that's how you know out there if you get into that seat i don't know like if that stuff that you guys are in is maybe a little bit wider if you want to say like I don't want to call it basins, but yeah, it, it, is. Sh- it is. It yep. is. I mean, the if you call it a basin where I shot mine, it was probably 300 yards across. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you get up further, and that stuff gets to be a lot narrower, yeah. where all of a sudden it's, you know, 
there there's a lot more like short little rolly things where it's only a hundred yards across. Mm-hmm. And then there's their, you know, depression that can then split left or right. Um, so I probably, you know, and then actually it kind of helps too with like being able to get across that stuff. Um, you know, if you guys had to cross a basin and there's deer in the bottom of it still, and you're watching yep. up there, it's kind of tough to, to, you know, rip across there right away. I think that's where our hard part was in that basin. As we were kind of navigating down, we had a landmark pick that we were heading to, and we got. We were kind of zigzagging back and forth across it. We'd go and get to a high point, and yep. like look over, and then get go to the other side mm-hmm. and get a high point, knowing that there was an end spot we wanted to be. But then once we got there, I Dude, guess it's it from felt the, so bucky. You remember being down in there? It felt like um, there was a, there was an old creek just bottom being in that like ran a layer there. of bucks. Yeah, it was like seven foot creek, like walls on this old creek bottom that led oh, to the river. Th- yeah, what you're, there's still like a, a cut, cut bank system down through the bottom. So like the side has, you know, it's a basin ish type mm-hmm. deal, but down in the bottom, there's still a lot of terrain whole network. And, and big, yeah, rock fixtures and stuff. And it just, it was, the whole thing was awesome. Yeah, and it was so cool. But you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, there's we what was there like seven bucks in that group? Yes. Like there's seven bucks in this. I don't even know if the buck I killed was in that group. Yeah, we can't see any of them. Like they could literally like how are we going to be able to see well, in so, this ditch? So this is where I kind of want Jason's opinion is like what sucks about how we're doing it is like yeah we can see the deer at first light in this field and we can see that they cross into this basin and then we can assume they're within this whatever 10, 10 20 acre deal. But we don't ever know exactly where they bed down. And yeah. if if we were to decide to I don't, do a spike camp or somehow get into one of those high points on the other side of the river before dark, mm-hmm. essentially, I, I think you might be able to see them much closer where they go into. to where they're going. But there's a lot of, I don't know how you do that. Mm-hmm. No. Thoughts? <laughs> yeah. And, oh, not only that, like you are saying, like if you're, if you're already in there, at least then you can kind of make that play a lot easier than you know trying to drive around and mm-hmm. and then like you said hike like three miles into there you know well oh, and that's the change. thing yeah and i feel so much i feel changes. good enough about that spot that it's like you know struggle of camping aside it's a no-brainer like there's going to be deer filter up in mm-hmm. there i would say almost every morning yeah but logistically you know how do we well the, it's not even the spike tent it's the fact that almost a guarantee there's going to be red flag warnings and we're not going to be able to fire fire all of that how do you Uh, and uh, and what we ended up with we we went in there around lunchtime jason worked to that bottom you can't burn on it to begin with jared public land yeah jared killed probably an hour before dark maybe an hour and 20 minutes yeah and then but by the time we were packing we were already out out of any liquids like and we packed as much as we possibly could knowing that we're gonna have other gear and potentially a pack out like we were out of liquids and it's like well, now what? I do have a fix. For, I think we need to take a live straw with us this year. Live straw, whatever. And then just whenever, if we're all the way down in there. Go to the river. Get water from the river. Mm-hmm. Sounds right. I've never used Beanie. one. There. Boom. Solution. Yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> Problem check solved. it off the list. Deer's practically dead. He's <laughs> already on the wall. And we got the runs for the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here, drink this. How's it? How's, how, how do you feel? <laughs> That's my Russian vodka. <laughs> Uh, it is, it's, um, it's so cool though. And it, that's one thing that we did here, Jason is from like where we're at to where you're at. And it's not that far, right? In fact, yeah, it's not far at all, especially as much as we drive every day, but, um, it, it's, there's still a big difference in that terrain and kind of what, how that all lays out. Um, and I think that again, like people hear this and they're probably like, man, these guys are just driving. Like you still got to work, you still got to get in there. But I mean, it is a lot oh, of just, dude. It's it's work. Yeah, it's it's. I'm, a, I'm going to the gym with a hundred pounds on my back every well, you're day, over climbing a stepper, it. and yeah. I'm gonna struggle when we get in there. No, it's, you won't. It's hard work. Yeah. You'll be beast mode. It'll be fine. I will, but it'll it's still a struggle. I'll be able to pack Colton in your backpack. If he cries, I might have to. <laughs> but no, it, it's it's hard, man. Mule deer hunting is not easy. Yeah. I will say it's not. Because we've talked to some guys that do the high country mule deer hunts, mm-hmm. it it's not as involved as a Colorado high country mule deer hunt. Mm-hmm. I don't have to get a trailer full of llamas that I've been feeding all year. <laughs> do you know <laughs> what I mean? And and do that kind of a thing yeah. and, and source my water and, and that kind of deal. But yeah, I feel like for <laughs> our, our hunt style, this just 
fits it better, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine going hard all day, but when we come back, we eat and we crash, and then we reset the well, button. Marshall said it best. He's like, why would you kill a deer way up there if I can kill a deer, like, right right there? Yeah. yeah. yeah from, like, a Midwestern, like, standpoint, you know, I, I guess that's – it's an easy transition, like, a non-scary transition, you could Agreed. say. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not having to try to figure out how to – you know, how to ration food, how to figure out calories, you know, where to get water, you know, how to filter it. Like those are things that we don't really have to worry about, you know, hunting if you want to say you know, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You can do a lot just you can just do day hunts, you know, if you if however yep. you want to call it more. Like that's you know, you're you don't have to you know, you don't have to like, unless like what you guys have, you guys have the opportunity. You feel like you've got an area that you're mm-hmm. not going to get bothered by people likely being, especially being that deep. Um, like yeah. that's, you know, pretty good opportunity, but I mean, Hey, if that other one is 200 yards from the truck again, and yep, you can make it around the lip, that's a quarter mile down the road and get in front of them. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good, like, ju- like just as much fun, but way more accessible. Especially to yeah. a Midwesterner or Eastern. We're, we're from Pittsburgh, so. Well, I mean, the stock itself is just unique um, to our style of hunting. You know, being able yeah. to, like, say, okay, here's a mis- – and, I mean, like, even those first ones, like, yeah, I parked the truck right off the road. Um, and there he is. Parked the truck right yeah. off the road and, you know, made up 300-yard stock, and it took me 40 minutes. Ah, oh, dude, I'm so fired up to go back. I can't, I like, I can't believe we get to go mule deer hunting. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. That's really cool. Uh, I guess, uh, separate question. Have you run into any, uh, rattlesnakes out there? <laughs> I've ran to a few. Um, nothing that's the very first year I was ever out in that area. We were actually whitetail hunting, which is what then spiked into seeing like my first, you know, if you want to say not first mule deer, but seeing like the first mule deer in a field that I can hunt. And it's like, why am I not hunting that thing? That <laughs> thing's way bigger than what we're hunting. Um, <laughs> but literally the first night, uh, buddy and I were walking out and, uh, he was about three feet from just, and it was just a prairie rattler, but you know, just happened to like look down and, and it was already like, you know, coiled up center of the road, but we've come across uh, a few of them. Um, I do wear snake boots just because I'm a little extra paranoid. And then by wearing snake boots, and I don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, n- knock on wood, we were prepared. We we just I just have canvas. We get gators. Gators, basically. Sure. But uh, we didn't see any. Mm-mm. Knock on wood. I kept. It, I really was expecting to. It felt snaky. Felt snaky. I had more issues with pulling cactus out of me than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I hate cactus. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yep, yeah, they suck. I'm like, there's nothing here. What am I sitting on? Yet it's still jamming me in the butt. <laughs> yeah, it's rough country, man. It's it's jagged out there. Yeah, it is something. Um, I think when you start to look at it, and, and again, that's why I kind of asked about the whole, um, I guess ravine or coolies that are way back in it. Like, there's a weird attractiveness to that style for me, not because I think it's it better. <laughs> But, like, to know, like, okay, I'm going to hike two miles back in. There's this huge draw, and, like, there's probably a giant back there. And it very well could be. But in the same breath, like, a lot of those deer are probably coming up to the front where your position, where your vehicle is at some point or moving back and forth. And so it, it's just that weird understanding of, like, it's when part, you— It's part of the adventure. When we, you get we, eyes we on We want them. it to be hard. I know. I do, but I don't want to be, like— like overwork for it when there's like, Oh, like I can kill a huge buck 200 yards off the road. And yeah. it, again, we didn't like, that's an illusion that could happen. Yeah. Um, it, it could. I th- just think every opportunity is going to be different. Like it would have been so cool if you had killed that buck, it would have been awesome. It's like, dude, first day freaking slammer muley. Yep. And, uh, just wherever the deer are, man, we're just gonna find a way to have fun getting to them and, you know, just doing it. Mm-hmm. It's a different mentality. Like try to get around. Cause like, hunting here i mean we've got i don't know exactly what the numbers are but there's way more bull hunters in you know pennsylvania or wisconsin than what there is even gun hunters yep. times five you know north dakota say yep so like that pressure factor isn't there so i mean hunting public around here you know i'm mentally i'm always thinking 
you know, where's the back corner of this? Cause mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to walk or I even think about anything else. Um, yeah. where I don't I think it's more pressure driven out there. There just isn't that, especially that time of the year, you know, yeah. we're still in summer patterns. Um, you know, I just, that I would say that's always like a, a mental hurdle. Like I said, like from mapping, um, I always want to go look at the far stuff, but it's like, man, I need, you know, circle back. And, um, you know, I guess I don't really care where I kill a deer from, I guess I'm out there for, you know, I'm out there for a reason of finding a buck and, and getting them. So, yep. I think that's it, man. I, I think that we all want an adventure, but like, it's, it's just cool. And I know like mine was obviously uh, a, probably a two year old buck. I think yours is probably a three like the size of those deer are just like mind blowing compared yeah, to a white huge. tail, like the bodies yeah. on them and especially yours, because that thing was living in an alfalfa patch pretty much. Yeah. And like the amount of fat. It was way bigger it, than any white tail I've ever seen. It was killed. insane. And it was not a fully mature mule deer. No. We like walk up. I'm like, holy hell, this thing's I can't huge. imagine. Yeah, dude, if we kill like a six or seven year old mule deer, it's going to be like, I don't know. What are those things weigh? 420 pounds? <laughs> probably high threes. <laughs> right? Three threes. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's in mid- we I don't know. I mean, just some of those Midwestern whitetails will weigh 300 pounds. I would say a six to eight year I old bet, mule deer out there probably is pushing 400 pounds. I bet yours was over 300. Yeah, three year old muley. Mm-hmm. Similar to Definitely that. In the shoulders and just, uh, just like the body cavity is deeper. That's always, yep. I don't know. Is whenever I'm like looking at one on the ground, it's like, chest cavity is like another eight inches taller than a white tail i was like Crazy. i was like so proud of my stock last year just it's impressive it man. was so f- cool like it just we, we, when we came around we were clear down we were getting we knew we were getting into them because we were clear down at the bottom yeah we glassed these bucks in the morning they worked across the river we're like all right they're bedded across the river somewhere it took us all day because i stocked that other buck twice to get down all the way to the river so now we're within you know, I saw, I shot yeah, 200 yards from the river, we're pretty close to the river. We're like, dude, anywhere in here, there could be anywhere in here. And then we come around this next bend. We're in all kinds of sign and we're looking face to face at, what do you think? A hundred yards mm-hmm. from this buck. And he's, he's right there. You see, he see it. He saw us. And then I think the sun, I don't know what the sun was doing, but e- either way we were able to kind of, I just kind of, we got down yeah. and we got back behind the, you know, the skyline from him. And so we just lost eyesight there and we just laid there for, Lay there and watch a him. minute, and then we peeked back up, and he was kind of back to what he was doing. You know, he's just eating sage. There was a bird on his antler. I remember picking off his velvet. He had just shed out like that day or the day before. It was really cool. And um, yeah. Jeremy and I split up, kind of, because I was like, "Dude, there's more of this draw that I can't, we can't see." It and, goes up, and I assume these other bucks we saw in the field, five or six of them are, are here somewhere. We got I got to see what's up here. And so Jeremy went to the right to get a better vantage point down this way. So we split up, or maybe thirty yards apart from each other, but mm-hmm. no contact. At can't that point. see. I'm in my socks at that point. I took my I took my. Uh, we decided I would try to shoot that deer if it was mm-hmm. the only one in there. I took my Keens off. I had to get a pair of hiking boots, and I put my socks. I just I wear heavy socks like while I'm stalking. They're just quieter. And um, the, the buck was working down the off of the bench that he had been on, and there was a big, like, rock structure between the bank he was coming down and, like, where I was at on the other side. And so there was going to be a blind point there for him. And as soon as he got to it, I basically, like, fell down the hill in front of me as quietly as possible. Just I did fell – I fell on a big – I fell, like, eight foot at one point. And I was freaking out because when he dove down there, one of these big drainages that have these eight foot walls like goes thirty yards from me, and I'm like, this deer's gonna walk right down. What do you think? Drainage. Thirty, forty yards? He would have ended up. Yeah, yeah, he would have ended up in front of Jeremy, like thirty, forty yards. Um, and so <laughs> once he got down there, I was like wide open, like he's not gonna hear me. There's no leaves like out here and stuff. And so I just basically ran in his direction and got to this, the rock structure that was between us, and then I just kind of eased, eased up on top of it. Sure enough, like a peek over the edge, there he is, like eight, ten yards. Yeah, I conf- like confirmed he was there, tucked back down, and so I recommend this for anybody that's spotting, stalking, mule deer hunting. Is I'm in a squat position, like squatting around a fire, and I draw, draw my bow back and get the full draw, and I kind of anchor, and then I just stood straight up, locked in, and and let him have it at like like eight yards, ten yeah. yards, and turn yeah. around and 
It was awesome. Arms up to Jeremy, and he, yeah, he died in 40 yards. Mm-hmm. Fell right over. It was sick. And that was the only buck that we saw. That was the only buck we saw, yeah. There, we saw one move earlier than that, just get up and reposition, but that entire side. Oh, so cool. No bucks. So cool. They could have been up that ditch and boogered up Yeah, they might have been just, you know, in those cut banks and mm-hmm. never heard us or yeah. whatever. Never saw us. Yeah. Less than a month. It's cool for whitetail guys, man. I mean, it is. Um, I still don't know. Like, I mean, I love being out there in the Like, whitetail's still my thing. But, like, there's something else about that type of hunting. Um, I don't know. It's just a different style. and It, it checks all or, the boxes of what we wanted. An, an early, fun hunt. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's fun. It's, like, it's not as high pressure because we get to ha- just talk and, like, yeah. do different hunts all throughout the day. And it's so early that it's, like, dude, let's just go have fun out west and try to kill a mule deer. Yeah. It's, like, an in-the-moment, a little bit different, like, tactical. And like, what you were just talking about, you know, slipping shoes off, putting on different socks. Like, like you're able to, like, do different things than what you can't do here. Yeah. You know, you know, you're where you're, you know, maybe obviously putting time in ahead of the season, you know, planting food plots and whatnot. But then you, if you want to say pick your spot and then you lay claim to, uh, you know, I'm going to sit in this tree for two hours, you know, whatever, two to four hours. And this is, this is it yeah. where out there it's like, you know, my decision is, is my feet and my, and my yeah. role. And I, you know, um, am I going to stick it out here? You can just, you can make like minute by minute decisions and you've got to mentally think about everything. Like you said, you know, taking your boots off to swing down and around to get in position, like ahead of him, like you're making an assumption where he's going and like you're hunting him, Mm -hmm. you know, like that hunting instinct, like kind of kicks through like you're it was dude i felt it too i felt just that instinct of like i gotta jump over this ledge i gotta get up on him and like i that one worked out like we blew some stocks and things didn't work out too but it's when it comes together i i think the cool thing it's never it's never boring like well that's what i'm though it's never boring that's what i'm looking at is like there you can't tell me if you know if you're gonna be trying to hunt in these places you cannot have a failed hunt you can't go sit in a tree stand for four hours and be like well didn't see any deer like you go until you find deer like you bring the action to yourself which is what's so fun about it compared to whitetail hunting where listen if it's 80 degrees out for the opening week you're not seeing shit yeah and nothing nothing's moving yeah right out there it's like cool i killed mine it was 90 some degrees and it's like yep he was in the shade boom killed him like we just went after him you just go which is that's we need, what's we awesome. need to send. I don't know if I told you, Jason. I tell you about the Velvet Lock stuff that we're using. Mm. I tell you about this. Yeah, we'll that's have to. Good. We'll send you some. Yeah, that sounds like some interesting stuff. He actually used it on a set that was, if you want to say, by freeze dryer method, was past the ability to save them, and just hosed it down with that Velvet Lock stuff, like in the last two weeks. Who's this? I was super impressed with it. Who is this? Uh, uh, just a good friend of mine is a taxidermist. Oh, right on. That uh, he was, that we're already talking about, uh, he's got some bottles that I was going to take with. Yeah, um, no, dude, we'll send you some. We got a bunch but, in the office. Well, dude, tell us, I, you kind of shared with me on the phone, but tell us how you've, what methods you've used in the past for preserving velvet or like what, what you've done. You know, I mean, super careful and keep it dry. I mean, you know, keep it as cool as I can and as dry as I can. Isn't it, like, isn't it crazy? I don't mean to cut you off. Just, isn't it crazy that even somebody who's been hunting mule deer, almost everybody I ask that question to, their their face is like, hope for the best, like, yeah, basically. Just terrible. I mean, like, you know, it's just, I don't, there is no great answer, you know, at least from uh, besides building a cooler and finding dry ice, but yeah. I feel like I'd almost, I'd waste three hours trying to go find dry ice somewhere than just get three hours closer to home and, and get, you know, get them in a freezer. Yeah. Uh, so, and you've taken, um, like syringes, you said you used to go to like tractor supply and buy horse syringes and stuff for, um, I guess I haven't, but I've done, I guess we've done that before. Like with just acetone, try and dry, it, you know, dry out. Acetone is what you use. I believe that was used there. Lacquer thinner. I think it was. I think it was acetone, though. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it must have been David I was talking to. So Dave's used... Uh, David Wise? David Wise has mm-hmm. used um, formaldehyde, for sure. Which is the common There's one. There's something but he also... said is better, though. 
it's a similar, it's a more attainable mm. type of a chemical, but still having to. Well, I mean, it. when you think about acetone, you're thinking about that alcohol to just like push it yeah. out, you know. But yeah, I mean, we use that Velvalock on my buck as soon as we got to them, you know, and it was great. Yeah. We'll and put the true test on it this year. Until the Beatles ate it. Yeah. You can't freeze <laughs> yeah. it either. Well, we're still learning how to use it. You can't freeze it. It's got to be hot. Yeah, hot and dry. And uh, it needs to have adequate so is, time to cure up before you put it in Beatles. Mm-hmm. Is that supposed to be like, a, you know, once it's done and it's done its process, done, done. its thing, that, that is, that's it? It's done? It's, once yep. it's done, it's done. And he says 72 hours to cure it up permanently. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to leave it which is pretty counterintuitive, but as as hot as possible. Like leave it out in the sun, leave it bake, I think tips up. Tips up. So, and it just spray it from the tips all the way down to the base and it'll push, push the blood out. It's alcohol. It just basically cures it. And there's essential oils in there too, I think that. Mm -hmm. Keep the flies and everything off of it. So when it's out hot in there, like you don't have insects and everything getting into it, it it has like a natural bug repellent. It does have a bug repellent. So you don't have to worry about bugs getting into it either. So once you spray it, it's done. It's done. Yeah, like you said, like, the perfect for early season out there. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, it's going to be over 90. Well, yeah. dude, they just came out with um, another product that they're calling Hide Lock, and it's a similar type of a product for the hide. And sure. so, so the guy that's developing a lot of these products used to be a guide in Nevada, and a bunch of his old, you know, buddies and guides and stuff were reaching out to him saying, like, it's cool that you figured out the velvet thing. That's awesome. But we're still losing a bunch of hides because of the heat and stuff, and like they're the bags we're putting in the coolers are leaking, and so so he you know figured out a formula for for preserving that as well. So when we go out this year, if I shoot a if either one of us shoot a velvet muley, we're gonna treat the antlers right on the spot with the velvet lock, and then we're gonna spray down the whole hide, you know, in the near uh, in the ears and the nose, like the the entire deal. We're gonna spray it down with with hide lock, and that'll basically guarantee that it's you know, safe until we can get it back to a taxidermist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Like I said, it's an awesome product, like just to have, um, I mean, Hey, I mean, that's kind of why, I mean, I guess that's why I started going out there. I mean, velvet's cool. You know, like it's, uh, would like to keep that for years down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Did you, have you ever had, have you had any complications? I guess this kind of goes back to where we're hunting distance from vehicles, but like, you know, I mean, we were pretty efficient when we cut up mine in the field because it was so hot. Um, like, do you have any worries about that or just, you know, get it, get it processed, get it in game bags and get it out of there to the cooler? Yeah. I mean, I'd say I've, I, if you want to say locked out or, you know, I guess feel like I've done it enough now that I've never really ran into that issue. Um, but I also, you know, I, I separate, you know, each bag too, so that each quarter, um, you know, if I don't have enough bags with me the day it happens, you know, I get back to the truck, it's separated. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I guess I always try to keep things away from getting wet. You know, that's always, um, I did that a couple years ago with a Nebraska deer that like just the meat had just gotten saturated on the way home. And well, nine hours later after getting, you know, saturated, it was, you know, not all of it was junk, but a good portion of it was, mm-hmm. um, so I guess I've always avoided just things getting wet and, um, and just working quick, just knowing that, you know, not kind of screw around and get things broken down and get yeah, it in bags and get it hung up. Yeah. I think, I think that's it. I mean, we, um, you know, obviously it's hot. You don't want it to be out in that heat too much, but I think a lot of people rush it to like, just throw it in ice coolers or something like that. And then that wetness starts to take effect where like when we got back, we, yeah, you know, we were in the shade. It's still hot, but we're in the shade. We, Ice is great, but you got to bag it. You got to bag it. Can't right? get wet. We cut it up, cleaned it up nice, then Ziploc, then into the ice. And I think we did well. We did great. Yeah. In fact, it, dare I say, like, I thought I liked my mule deer better than whitetail. Did you? I did. I think a lot of that's the alfalfa that they were eating, but. It was part of oh, the experience, too. We ate it that night. Other stuff up north, too. I mean, they're, they are awesome. I think early season mule deer are phenomenal. Yeah. Um, really, really, really good. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we, we ate tenderloins from Dude, mine that I, night. We've never, <laughs> I, we've never eaten so good as we did in North Dakota. Aiton? Eaton? Yeah. We, we stopped in uh, a, a town or a decent grocery store before, before, right before we got to town. 
And we do, we just feasted and we bought food for like five or six days and we consumed most of it. And the, because oh, we, we killed our deer, we're like, well, I better cook the rest of our eggs and drink the rest of our beer. And- oh man. Monday. It was like, was it Monday morning? Yeah. I think it was like Monday morning. We woke up, it was pouring down rain. It was cold. It was nasty. I mean, those roads were so, slick. I was shit. so glad we we're done. Yeah. We woke up, made like all the breakfast food we had, had a couple breakfast beers and we're like, cool. I guess we'll just like pack up and go home now. Cause we're tagged out. <laughs> Everybody else is looking miserable outside. We're like, oh, glad we don't have to be in that. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pretty cool experience. I was going to ask that. That's one thing that we haven't experienced. I don't know. You've been out there more than us. Um, it seems like in a lot of those areas, if you get rain, it gets slick as shit on some of those roads. Yeah. Yeah. The roads are just God awful then. Um, yeah. I mean, yes, same, same deal. Um, South Dakota is the same way. Um, just turns into gumbo and and it's a pain to get anywhere and yeah. then it's a pain to walk anywhere too because it just sticks in the bottom of your boot and then keeps compacting and compacting until you're trying to walk around in five inch mud heels and you know what i wonder when i used to race motocross we used to spray the bottom of our fenders with pam yeah it's so it didn't stick yeah i wonder if you just do that with your boots i mean I mean, those guys were telling us, they're like, hey, when this rain's coming, you want to be done before it because it's going to be nasty for about two days out there trying to get around. Like, okay, yeah, no worries. Yeah, done. <laughs> well, as of right now, there's no threat of rain anywhere, so. Yeah, it'll be the day that we get there, yeah, I'm just sure. Yeah, monsoons. Yeah. Uh, are you going for opener this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I- well, I scout and then probably just through the weekend. I, I kind of want to hunt out there during the rut. I'm kind of like, we talked about that. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, again, we're so far into the whitetail season at that point, I guess. Um, and, and we're hunting. That, that's a big part places. of the appeal for mule deer for us is like, it early. doesn't cut into whitetail. Yeah. It's early. Yeah. But I mean, I could see that being like attractive to hunt out there and, you know, getting the right places for rutting muleys and stuff and a whole nother beast, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've always liked South Dakota at that time frame, and I, I feel like you know deer quality is probably better in North Dakota. Mostly, probably just because of the whole tag thing; they don't give out as many as what South Dakota does. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's always a fun hunt in South Dakota when they're rutting, and I would have to imagine that it will very easily translate um, to North Dakota the same way. Yeah, hopefully not more frustrating because there's you know because of the private stuff. Sure. Um, but then again, if they're all some more people, then probably find them elsewhere. Too. I was going to say, it could pull them off. Like some of those big bachelor groups aren't going to be all bachelored up on the same private ground, I would imagine, at that point. At least be spread yeah. out. I know I know. in South Dakota that's definitely the case. Like mid-October, but there's just way more pressure in South Dakota because you've got goat hunters and then all, all the deer hunters out there too. Yep. Um, you know, all of, you know, really those deer are always getting pressure you know their goat season starts in august and all the way through september and um yep. those deer are kind of getting bumped you know obviously not always specifically a deer owner but somebody um that's definitely obvious when it's late november out there that those bucks are coming off of you know absolutely coming off of private and not they are not there in october <laughs> yeah yeah, that's. I would be interested to see what that kind of pans out as in in terms of looking at that hunting situation from, you know, North Dakota on a rut standpoint, from a South Dakota on a rut standpoint. Like you said, you got these longer seasons going on, and again, even though the non-residents can't hunt, um, you know, public land until October one, the residents, if they're hunting, can and start pressuring them right out of the out of the gate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm ready, man coming I'm ready to be back out there and and get into them when you go out and um you said you'll be there scouting before the opener how many days do you typically go out prior to opener for scouting i used to go out like three days ahead of time yeah but uh, that that becomes really long like because mm-hmm. you've only got you know an hour or so in the morning of movement and and if you do see any you're trying to not bump them yeah you know, you're being as you know shy as you possibly can to them so now i usually just go out for a full day and i just i just know just know the areas now too of mm-hmm. if uh if there's cattle in this section i'm gonna i'm gonna run down and i know you know kind of a high point to watch or to walk in on on a different piece um to 
to to see the, the same area, I guess. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Just knowing. Yeah, no, I think that makes a big difference. Not that I think that we're like super confident, but we have some of those areas in our head that it's like, okay, the moment we roll in that well, evening or we, that morning. We did. If we were just going back to North Dakota, I think we'd be all right, right into them. But yeah. because we added South Dakota, we're, we're kind of taking a gamble here that we're going to give and be right back. Be able them. to redo what we did in North Dakota oh, and figure it out it. for the first time in South Dakota. It's it's kind of a risk. It's the Dakota double. But why not? Yeah. We're young. Yeah, why not? Stay- one just North Dakota and then South Dakota. I guess that uh, other way. Yeah. South Dakota yeah. opens on the first, and then, like I said, we're not going to leave Big Deer to go to Big Deer, but North Dakota opens on the third. So earliest will be there would be the third, mm-hmm. which I, I am torn about. I'd hate to miss out on North Dakota Velvet Muleys if we're not on them. My, in get, South Dakota, my guess is we're gonna so we're gonna roll in the South Dakota on the thirty first. Um, afternoon. Yep, afternoon thirty first. So we'll have some scouting and some stuff there laid out. We're going to hunt the first, second, and at that point, we'll make a decision of like, hey, we're on deer and we don't want to leave, or we're only two hours from North Dakota. Let's get up there and we'll start scouting opening morning and be ready to go. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it was a gamble. Um, We kind of just put it out there because it was like, well, you know, if we can get some of these neighboring landowners, like there's deer. I mean, the other thing is it's, it's, two or three days we're already driving out there like maybe maybe we can pull the old miracle and and drop a couple in a couple days and then jump to north dakota and be in it for seven that'd be best case scenario that's kind of the strategy there but you know we'll see i mean uh, there's deer there you know we're in the right part of south dakota for sure it's just they're either on your property or they're not and if they're not can we get access to where they are sure when does your guys stuff open up back around home uh Typically last week is September. Yeah, last week, September, early October. Mm-hmm. Yep. You guys open up, what, mid-September in Wisconsin? Yeah, it's usually a full weekend, uh, however that lays. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't even know when it opens up this year. I'll be elk hunting probably during that time anyways. So it, uh, this will just be a good step of uh, hunt mule deers out this way, and then you'll, then you'll just – start going further we're, west we're already putting in points. Oh, we're putting in <laughs> yeah i spent a lot of money on tags this year you did uh, jared's got an entire folder full of tags mm-hmm. or points yeah like my first point on places it takes like 18 years to draw. yeah might as well put in though <laughs> yeah no i think it'll be cool man we're excited about it and um i guess uh for the listeners who will listen to this thing can they uh potentially expect a video from 2020 from you um i don't know i uh I've kind of like put the camera stuff away um, and just kind of like enjoyed last year. I kind of enjoyed just being a, just going hunting again. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is just time, you know, two kids at home and yep. I always find a hobby too to do. It doesn't matter what time of the year it is, you know, whether it's hunting coyotes in the, in the winter or, or fishing, like it doesn't leave a lot of time to sit behind a computer and edit yeah um, well you film but, it we'll edit it there you go huh <laughs> yeah either that or we, yeah. we tag out early and send one of the coltons up jason's way to film them yeah you film it we'll edit it there you go <laughs> yeah yeah it'd be cool man i i do think um and i think that was one of the things we were excited to get you on here about is like there, you know, there's a few out there, um, Breaking Point and some of those guys, but there's not a ton of content coming out of this area, which I mean, I'm out of fine the, with. the Dakotas. Mm-hmm. The Element guys are up there too. Yep, Element we guys. We talked to them. Yep. They're out of Texas. Yep. But it's just, there's not a lot. And um, <clears throat> uh, Heartland Bow Hunter's been going out there for a few years. They do Whitetail in South Dakota and then Mule Deer in North. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. Or vice versa. Like, I think Sean killed a nebraska muley last year yeah. they're they're in that vicinity the four corners it's just a really cool area not again may not be an every year thing for for guys but for us eastern whitetail guys or midwestern whitetail guys like Yankees. it's a yeah it's a very uh accessible place to get to and and change it up a little bit if you want to drive oh, i mean i, I mean care. that's the thing i'll like, drive wherever. We, we are crazy though because i mean it does seem crazy to us because we're like yeah i'll drive 24 hours to hunt for a week but a lot of guys won't do that. Why? <laughs> Just priorities. How far is it for you, Jason, to get out to your area? Nine. If usually when I leave here, 
I can, I can usually get there like, and I can be pulling down gravel roads, like as the sun is coming up. So, mm, uh, ours so is kinda got extensive. My, yeah, that, dry. We'll leave on the 20, the 30th, 30th at like two, three, like three o'clock. And that'll put us there at like four o'clock the next, the next day, the 31st. We'll have like an hour to throw camp together and then we'll scout that night and then we'll be hunting the fall, the following morning. Mm-hmm. That is a haul. Yeah. That's a, There's two of us though. A, so we get to switch back and forth. Yeah. And the camera guys, which there's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're drooling on themselves. Uh, they're already in the back. asleep in the back drive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it it is kind of crazy to go out, but I mean, you know, I don't know what else are you gonna do. Exactly. Right? I, there's nowhere I'd rather be. So I've I'm, I've already I'm happy to I've do already that. placed it in the wife and kids calendars, so it's like, well, we're going. Yeah, we're yeah. going. Yeah. No, I think it'll be cool, man. And um, you know, we we appreciate you coming on the podcast today. We'll definitely have to catch up here maybe after the hunts and and kind of do a recap with everybody and see how we've uh had success or failures or the awesome. adventure of it. But I think a lot of the people would be really interesting to hear that kind of contrast of of our actual hunts so close together yet, you know, I'm sure each are going to be really unique in in how they are and yeah, man, offer stands if you end up filming, we'll we'll add it on the hunter side. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, uh, appreciate the offer, and yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested. I'm very interested in hearing from like you guys' perspective, like where you guys are hunting that that we're not that far away, but yet, like our deer are definitely doing different things. Yeah. So that's that's kind of cool to hear. Do you, do you want some velvet antler? Do you want us to send you some? Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Absolutely. Text me your mailing address. Yeah, we'll send him some. We'll send him a hunter shirt too. Yeah, we'll some, send swag. You some stuff. Cool, man. Cool. Well, Jason, we appreciate it, bud. Um, yep. You know, nice. we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing kind of how the hunt goes. And, and like I said, we'll definitely powwow up once we all get back. And hopefully we got a bunch of racks See to you show. on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, too. All right, all right buddy. You're welcome. We'll see you, man. Nice. Well, if that doesn't get you fired up to go and kill some Dakota Isn't that cool? muleys. That's the first dude that we like were fanboying out over on the mule deer stuff. And there he is. Yeah. And just good hobby. Guy. Just hobby making videos, you know? Um, really cool though. It, it is funny cause he is, I, I, I had no idea that he was hunting South Dakota. So that's cool to hear that aspect of it. Um, there is cattle on some of our farms, so yep. see how that plays out. But again, if that gives us access to the local area and we have a base set up somewhere, work some, gold. some landowner charm, maybe I'll make some calls tomorrow. Yeah. I think it'd be good. I mean, again, it's just the adventure, man. I mean, it, it's, we don't want it to be like, I'm sure people are going to listen to this, like, holy cow, these guys just go out there, drive around and like see a mule deer walk out and like shoot it. It's not like that at all, but it is so different than the whitetail side of things. And again, it's just, you know, you can be as aggressive if you, as you want. If you don't want to be aggressive, you're probably not going to make a bunch of stocks, but if you're willing to be aggressive and know that you're probably going to screw up at least 50% of them, then there's a hell of a chance that you're going to come home with a velvet muley or at least a muley in well, general. I mean, dude, it's it's like a whole life. You could you could build a lifestyle around it. I mean, I I haven't stopped like working out and stuff. Like, uh, I would do that anyways, just mm-hmm. because you know I like to to feel healthy and stuff. But like th- this gives me a goal. This literally this mule deer hunt even more than our whitetail stuff is like, dude. That's why I like. That's why I got. That's why I ruck around with a hundred pounds on my back on the stepper, and that's why mm-hmm. you know because when it yeah, maybe I'll see him from the road, but it's, it's 600 yards out there and I've got to beat him to that point and it's some rough terrain in between and I want it to be enjoyable. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, a fat guy could kill a mule deer. I'm sure it's been done, but I, I want to enjoy it and I want to be really good at it. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I do yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it all comes back to, it is a great transition point between our whitetail style and a high country. Um, and frankly, I just, I kind of like the feel of it. I mean, like you mentioned, and, and it's a great point to it is like, it's just different because like we're driving around, we're talking, we're stalking, we're talking like yeah. you're, you're always having a camaraderie aspect to it, which frankly, you don't have to in whitetail season. Yeah, You get a lot more of it that way. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> whether we have the human centipede of four or five of us <laughs> in a line doing a, a, a stock on a muley or we're splitting up into two groups or however it is, like you still are going to have Hold some camaraderie. On Hold on to my belt. <laughs> Like it, oh, get down, Colton. <laughs> no, you, the other Colton. Um, but it'll just be, it'll be interesting to see how that all kind of plays out. But dude, so excited. I hope we had, we, we did luck out last year. I know my day was hot, but we had some unbelievable weather. It was like 
70 degrees 50s like it felt like fall like everything about it was like just really, Dude, really I, nice. I don't remember anything bad about that trip everything about it was awesome yep even the drive we made it even the drive the drive home was kind of rough and a little del- delirious but i don't had, remember any of but that. we had two racks in the back so it was pretty sweet which we called so maybe we'll call it again maybe there'll be three or four racks in the back we've got that many tags so the yeah. idea is to punch those <laughs> Well, we appreciate everyone listening to the Hunter podcast. Um, it was cool to have Jason Baloo on. Um, Baloo. Baloo. And uh, definitely look forward. We we will make sure that we grab him back in the podcast after we all get back and resituated from the hunts. Kind of do a recap. Hopefully we all have success. Uh, if not, we'll sure as hell have a bunch of stories to tell. So we'll catch you next time. Looking forward to it, man. Later. Take me home.